three, two, one, and go. Hello and welcome to the fifth in the series of our sessions on architecture and philosophy. Today we'll be looking at Gilles Deleuze. I'm delighted to have Helen Frischow here with us today. Helen is actually in Melbourne, Australia, hence the slightly unusual start time. I also have a recording that was done with Andrew Ballantyne um, two days ago, which I will be playing. Uh, Andrew is based in, in, in France at the moment, and uh, uh, it's the middle of the night in France. Um, this, I should say, this is part of the doctoral consortium an initiative that was set up by Philip Yuan and myself over the summer. Um, and uh, during the summer, um, Philip Yuan organized a series on architecture and philosophy um, on behalf of the, the, the uh, Tongji University Digital Futures uh, PhD um, program. And this is one organized by the FIU DDES program as a continuation of that, uh, of that project. Um, we are now in the, the fifth of this series, um, and uh, uh, we have uh, three more to go. Uh, next week, we will be um, uh, returning to our, our normal time, um, and Patrick Schumacher will be doing a session on Nicholas Lerman. Uh, then on the 5th of December, Judith Butler, we have Helen Runting uh, from, uh, uh, from, from, um, uh, uh, from, from Stockholm, and um, Amelia Jones, um, the art theorist from USC, and then the final session will be on Gilbert Simondon with Andre Radman, Stavros, and Mercedes, and Victoria. Um, all of these uh, sessions have been, all the recordings of this have been uploaded onto the Digital Futures YouTube library, and that includes uh, the lectures given in the summer by Slavoj Žižek, Erin Manning, um, uh, uh, Sanford Quinta, Anna Maria Duran Callisto, and Mamo Delanda. Um, so it's a it's a repository, and the idea of that repository is to make these things available for the future for scholars throughout the world. Um, as as a recording, one of the, the points we, we came across is the fact that there's very few recordings of these thinkers that we're actually uh, addressing, and so to have something in English uh, free for everyone is we hope a, a, a valuable resource for the future. Um, I'm going to start off um, with playing. I'm going to start off playing um, Gilles Deleuze just to hear a few words of him speaking in French. Je n'ai pas besoin de la philosophie pour réfléchir. Je veux dire, les seuls gens capables effectivement de réfléchir sur le cinéma, ce sont les cinéastes ou les critiques de cinéma ou ceux qui aiment le cinéma. Ils n'ont absolument pas besoin de la philosophie pour réfléchir sur le cinéma. So let me just say a few words about uh, Gilles Deleuze. Um, uh, he was born in, in, uh, in Paris in 1925 and subsequently became a philosopher of uh, a professor of philosophy at the University of Paris, uh, Paris 8, Université de Paris 8, where Foucault and uh, Félix Guattari, two individuals with whom he's very closely associated, were also uh, teaching. He died in 1995 by suicide after throwing himself out of the window of his apartment. His ill health, he had lost a, a lung, uh, he had a lung removed because of tuberculosis, which caused him severe respiratory problems for the rest of his life, might have been a contributing factor in his suicide. Deleuze has enjoyed a reputation as one of the most innovative thinkers in an age increasingly preoccupied with the question of complexity. Indeed, Michel Foucault once predicted that the, the 20th century would be known as Deleuzean, and possibly the 21st century. And of course, Deleuze himself wrote a book on Foucault. So the connection between the two of them is very close. Deleuze's thought is a combination of a commentary on other thinkers, notably Nietzsche and Foucault, and his own highly original investigation, investigation suffused in his later work by the influence of his collaborator, the radical psychoanalyst Felix Guattari. We've already come across uh, Deleuze's thinking in the session on Foucault, and in many ways we could see this as um, uh, a kind of extension beyond that. Uh, he uh, he adds to the kind of discussion about uh, the issues of control um, in his in his in his thinking about um, uh, in in discussion about the this the 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 this postscript of society control, where um, following on from the, the the kind of the shift from the I guess the erosion of the hegemony of the physical from physical containment to the panopticon has been a physical space controlled by the gaze. Uh, uh, Deleuze talks about how in our contemporary world we have shifted from factories to corporations, 
and from machines to computers, computers, and the physical discipline has been replaced by more gaseous systems of control, where the credit has supplanted the gaze of the foreman, and humankind is no longer enclosed by physical space, but also enclosed, but enclosed, forever trapped by debt, ensnared in a system of limitless postponement. The other essay that he uh, uh, that is included in Rethinking Architecture is something on, is an essay on the city state, where he he looks at the kind of the, the, the difference between the state as a kind of top down system uh, that is controlling things and, and, and the city as a kind of place of the free flow of circulations and circuits. He was above all uh, a theorist of flux, plurality and movement. Deleuze rejected the more traditional concepts of sameness and rep representation in favor of repetition, proliferation and difference. He elaborated a series of concepts such as the monad, the striated and the fold, and particularly championed the riser, which we will look at uh, later. But it would be an injustice to the sophistication of Deleuze's thought to attempt any shorthand definition of the terms. It is precisely the fluidity of his thought that de denies such totalizing strategies. And I would say that Deleuze is possibly the most difficult uh, commentator to really, to, or thinker that we'd be addressing, to really try and um, appraise. Somehow, he always escapes any attempt to kind of pin him down in some senses. So Deleuze's work was prolific, and I'm not showing you all his books here, but these are some of the books that he wrote on his own, um, perhaps most famously De uh, Difference and Repetition on the left-hand side, but he also wrote a book on, on Francis Bacon, the painter, and, and two books on the cinema. He didn't, however, write anything on architecture, apart from made of making a few allusions to architecture in his other writing. But perhaps the most important influence on him was Felix Guattari, uh, seen here on the right-hand side. Uh, and in some senses, they also kind of constitute some kind of rhizome in themselves. Um, uh, Andrew Ballantyne will be talking more about uh, um, Felix Guattari um, later on. And it was their collaborations um, um, that perhaps Deleuze is most famous for, Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, A Thousand Plateau, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, which I use a lot in my teaching, and their book, which was very popular at the time, What is Philosophy? I want to um, start off by trying to sort of elaborate some of the conceptual pairings that seem to underpin um, the work of uh, of Deleuze, um, and one of those pairings is between the nomad, um, between the nomadic and the sedentary. Um, he's actually not referring to literal nomads. I'm showing you a video here of literal nomads. Um, he's referring to always towards towards concepts, um, to, uh, towards concepts. And in fact, he doesn't really refer to forms at all. Um, uh, and it is the concept of the nomadic, of the the deterritorialized, that really is central to his thinking. Nonetheless, in a strange way one can see that with a nomad, something else coming out. That is to say, you can see the way in which these terms, these conceptual pairings somehow fold into one another through a kind of process of, of reciprocal presupposition. The idea of being nomadic, nomadic ultimately folds into the notion of the sedentary. The idea of being deterritorialized feeds into the notion of, the of, the, of territorialization itself. So really what Deleuze is talking about is the idea of nomadic thought, of, of deterritorialized thinking, rather than physical deterritorialization. But nonetheless, there's something here that begins to sort of echo in some senses, because the nomad is in fact very much aware of territory. The fact that you can move anywhere um, doesn't mean to say you're going to move anywhere. The fact that you can be um, living anywhere, operating anywhere online these days means that actually not that place is unimportant, but play, place is precisely very important. Um, why be in a kind of decaying industrial town when you could be sitting near a beach in California? Um, uh, so you get this kind of the sense in which the, there is a kind of a, a play between these things. Deleuze was very much against the idea of binary oppositions, but somehow the idea of fold these 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 ideas folding in one, into one another make a comparison with the notion of the dialectic only too inevitable. Um, it's not really the dialectic is referring to; it's something else. The dialectic, in other words, is the way in which two opposites are often seen to be to be more close than they might at first appear. The, my favorite example is the one that Zizek uses to describe the difference between the photograph and the, the, the movie. The photograph being a frozen moment and the movie being a, an animated continuum. But as, as Zizek points out, they're both part of the same thing, because in the end, the, 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 the photograph 
is itself taken out of the continuum and a movie is itself made out of a series of frozen photographs that stitched together in an animated continuum. And so precisely when we see these nomads clear, carefully uh, searching out the place in which they're going to uh, um, uh, to rebuild their tents and so on, you can see that the notion of territory, where you take your, your, your cattle to graze and so on, is a fundamental part of how they operate. I want to then just kind of sketch out a few of the kind of conceptual pairings that you can find in Deleuze's work, not just the nomadic and the sedentary, and again, it's not the physical appearance, it's the conceptual notion that is important, but also the notion of smooth and striated, which is one of the, one of the kind of key, key concepts. Um, the smooth doesn't mean the physically smooth. What's, what Deleuze means by smooth is that which is not controlled, and he, he opposes that to the notion of striation, which means the controlled. And for Deleuze, the idea of the ocean or the sea, that's the kind of uh, the quintessential space, smooth space, where you can move around. So it's not about the smoothness of surface, but the idea of, of, of avoiding control itself. Similar um, concepts such as the felt as opposed to woven fabric illustrate this point, where the felt is a, a kind of matted collection of, uh, of fibers that are not connected, whereas the uh, woven fabric is, is very precisely controlled. Another kind of uh, a pair of a conceptual, um, another conceptual pairing in Deleuze's work is the difference between the, the, the tree and the rhizome. The tree is some kind of uh, um, a discrete entity that uh, is, 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 uh, uh, stands on its own, whereas the rhizome is a kind of interconnected network. And grass is a good example of a rhizome. Likewise, you can think about maybe uh, ginger roots or um, the banyan tree, where they, it kind of reconnects with itself. In architectural terms, uh, they refer to, uh, in A Thousand Plateau, they refer to the difference between what they refer to as the Gothic and the, the Romanesque. I think the Romanesque really means the classical in general. Um, uh, um, but essentially what they're pointing to is not architecture or, or indeed a style of architecture, but rather a way of thinking. Um, the, the, the Romanesque or the classical, we might say, that is to say the kind of, you go from the, from the, 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 the classical to, to, the, to, the, to, to the Romanesque, to the, um, to the Renaissance, to the Mannerist, to the Brock, to the Neoclassical and so on, is about fitting things into a kind of visual template. It's based very much on representation, whereas the Gothic is about understanding forces and flows. Um, they're also distinguished as, in the sense that the, the, the Romanesque or the classical is seen as what, what in, in terms of what Deleuze calls the major sciences, the state sciences, you're following a rule book in terms of proportions and so on, whereas the Gothic is more part of the minor sciences, part of experimental um, uh, construction, where maybe, maybe during that process, the vault will, might collapse and you'd rebuild it and rebuild it in an experimental sort of way. Um, you could see this in a sense, also in terms of the difference between um, two other conceptual pairings in in, um, in in Deleuze's work, the the morphogenetic, the morphogenetic, and the hylomorphic. Um, the hylomorphic is when you impose form on on matter from a, in a top down way, as in this CNC milling uh, going on on the on the left hand side. Side whereas the morphogenetic is when is when matter and material is allowed to express itself according to its internal forces, as seen here on the right-hand side with the balloon um, finding its form. And in architectural terms, then, you can possibly see that distinction between these two seemingly similar um, structures, in the sense they're made of curves, uh, Frank Gehry's uh, uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall on the left-hand side, and uh, a building in, in Holland by UN Studio, Transport Inter Interchange. Uh, in the sense that on, on the left-hand side, it's largely about representation. The structure is, is held together by a steel framework that doesn't necessarily, isn't morphogenetic, whereas on the right-hand side, uh, 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 the structure which has been um, uh, designed by, by Cecil Bauman is really a, a, a very precise structural understanding of things. It might come out as a curve, but the way of thinking behind these two structures is very different. It's a difference, in other words, between the hylomorphic and the morphogenetic. Let me play you then um, a video. I want to move on to discuss the theme of the rhizome and the theme of becoming two central ideas that are in, in, Deleuze, in, in Deleuze's work, and I, which I refer to in my, my book, Camouflage. Um, and what I'm showing you here is a relationship 
between a relationship of becoming between a wasp and an orchid. Uh, what is interesting about this process, um, it, which is described in biological terms as a form of mutualism, is that the two depend on one another. They've, they've grown to depend upon one another. In other words, what the wasp is doing is is uh, is is is, is, is been a, the wasp has been attracted by uh, the, the the nectar in in the flower and is gorging itself on that nectar, but the orchid is is uh, is making use of the wasp. Uh, the the mechanism as the as the wasp is gorging it, so it forces triggers off this uh, this uh, uh, this form coming down, which is laden with pollen, and the pollen then um, finds its way onto the back of the of the wasp. And then the orchid, and sorry, then the wasp once it's when it's, once it's finished or the nectar, then uh, flies on to the next orchid, thereby uh, uh, cross-pollinating the different orchids. And it's this process that is is one that is kind of fascinating for Deleuze and Guattari. The logic then is one of becoming. It is not a question of imitating some entity so much as entering into its logic. The term becoming captures the dynamic interaction between wasp and orchid. Becoming, becoming animal, becoming female, becoming molecular, becoming imperceptible, becoming other is a key concept in Deleuze's work. All forms of becoming are essentially about becoming other and involve a creative engagement with the other on the part of the subject. At the same time, a state of becoming is not constituted by any particular entity. It concerns, it concerns the space between various entities and constitutes a line of flight between them. Becoming is clearly an interactive process. It can never be limited to one individual entity. Becoming, um, uh, uh, it, should, it can never be limited to one individual entity becoming another. Becoming always involves a, a reciprocity, a mutual interaction. Deleuze and Guattari refer to this operation between the wasp and the orchid as a block of becoming. Through this process of becoming, a form of deterritorialization is affected. Deterritorialization might be described in terms of nomadology as an urge to resist stratification, a compulsion to be continually mobile and unconstrained by st uh, structured systems of control. In order to become other, we have to enter into a machinic assemblage with the other, an assemblage of parts that works and produces. The machine here is anything that operates and is conditioned by material flows. The machine therefore extends beyond any, any distinction between the mechanical and the organic to include both domains. The assemblage, meanwhile, could be defined as a loose affiliation of individual components that have come together to form a single body but a body which is never stable or unified, an ace-centered multiplicity that is subjective to continuous movement and variation. And one such assemblage would be the one between the wasp and the orchid, which should be understood as a multiplicity, as a multiplicity of multiple wasps and multiple orchids. Yet these connections are rhizomatic and remain in constant flux. They must never, be, they must never subscribe to any totalizing system they must always be incomplete, always open-ended, and always in a state of becoming. What results is a dynamic rhizomatic system which remains stable but never fixed. Another way to describe the process of becoming then is through the concept of the rhizo. Wasp and orchid as heterogeneous elements form a rhizo. The rhizome is itself a figure borrowed from biology, opposed to the principle of foundation and origin which is embodied in the figure of the tree. The model of the tree is hierarchical and centralized, whereas the rhizome is proliferating and serial, functioning by means of the principles of connection and heterogeneity. The rhizome is a multiplicity and as, and as, as such seeks to move away from the binary subject-object structure of Western thought. The rhizome achieves a sense of becoming. It affects a form of correspondence between the self and the other, but it should be stressed that the rhizome is not a form of representation. The rhizome steps beyond the limits of representation. Writing, for example, does not represent the, world's, the world, it forms a rhizome with it. We might therefore associate becoming in the process of adaptation and, and assimilation, which, uh, which is related to formation rather than form, but nonetheless operates through form. 
In such a context, we might understand design as a rhizomatic interaction between human beings and their environment. For Deleuze and Guattari, then, it is precisely through art, writing, philosophy, and other cultural activities such as design that one breaks down the barriers between the self and the other and becomes imperceptible. Let me just f f finish up by saying a few words about the reception of Deleuze uh, in the world of architecture. One cannot mention Deleuze without mentioning Mamel Delanda, somebody who has been instrumental in um, championing Deleuze's thought, especially in his early work. Um, this is a book that had a profound influence on me, A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, um, that followed on from his first work, The War in the Age of Intelligent Machines. and and led on to a series of other works where he, he begins to kind of progressively look at other subjects. But the influence, I would say, of Deleuze is, begins to slip away to, in his later work. What is interesting about Delander's approach is that in, he focuses, first of all, only on, on, on Deleuze and doesn't address Guattari at all. And secondly, he, um, he, he, in many ways, he tries to simplify, to explain, uh, to de-postmodernize um, Deleuze. And this leads to a particular take on, 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 on Deleuze, one that is, on the one hand, I think, much clearer than the, the, the standard understanding. At the same time, it is a kind of a particular take that is very much Delanders Deleuze. Contrasted to that, perhaps, we could see um, other engagements. Um, Deleuze published a book on the fold that seems to have been the inspiration behind um, an issue of architectural design, um, <clears throat> unfolding an architecture that seems to me to really in rather unfortunate ways to misunderstand what Deleuze is talking about. Deleuze is not talking about forms, he's talking about concepts. And it seems to me the same problem that happened with the word deconstruction, where architects automatically assumed that Derrida was referring to some form of construction, afflicts the question about the fold itself. Um, according to philosophers, what the fold is all about is the formation of different forms of subjectivities. It's nothing to do with literal form. It's nothing to do with the foldings of form. It's the folding of the subjectivity itself. Likewise, in that book, there's a there's a, a, a diagram of the Baroque house that appears, which which misleadingly is presented as though it is a plan or a design for a house. But in fact, according to the philosophers, it's really intended as an allegory to theorize the conceptual, the, the, the Baroque construction of the conceptual pair reading and seeing. It's nothing to do with literal architecture as such. The other group that was fascinated by Deleuze, and especially the concept of the fold, is a surface. I found out from John Rachman, I didn't realize that, but that's precisely why Deleuze actually refers to surfing in some of his, in some of his, um, his writings. Are the surfers thinking about the fold as a form, or are they thinking about the, 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 the wave as a form of, of morphogenetic um, formation? I don't know exactly, but it is interesting that the fact that Deleuze himself refers back to the surface in his own writings. If we are to look, though, at the, maybe the, the, the most authoritative text on Deleuze, um, uh, I would point towards these, these three books. Um, the two edited editions that Helen herself, Helen Fritcher, was involved in, Deleuze and Architecture and Deleuze and the City, and then the, um, the book uh, the, the, authored by Andrew Ballantyne, Deleuze and Guattari, for architects. And it seems to me these are probably the, maybe the most precise um, uh, books and things. I should, I should also add, perhaps, um, that uh, Bernard Cash uh, was a student, the architect Bernard Cash was a student under Deleuze, but he, in many ways his own work has moved away from Deleuzean thinking. He doesn't refer to Deleuze anymore. Anyway, for the next part, what I want to do is to play for you a recording of um, uh, an interview or a presentation which I recorded um, by Andrew Ballantyne um, two days ago, where he's talking primarily about Felix Guattari, but drawing out, uh, teasing out the relevance of the work of Deleuze and Guattari for architects following the publication of his book Deleuze and Guattari for Architects. So here is Andrew. Oops, sorry. Today I'm going to be looking at Deleuze and Guattari's ideas very briefly and thinking about what they might mean for architecture and how we think about it. Here's a shared screen. Is 
now. There we go. Now, first of all, Deleuze and Gattari have written a lot of books, uh, between them uh, dozens. And they, when we talk about them, we, we often drop Gattari's name. But Deleuze and Gattari worked together on three big books, A Thousand Plateaus and Anti-Oedipus, which you see here, uh, and also another book called What is Philosophy? Um, and their, their collaboration is, is very, very close. You can't tell who, who wrote what. Uh, but they also publish things in, independently. And we'll go on to um, one of those books shortly. But what they propose is that philosophy is the creation of concepts, which is a fairly contentious thing to be saying. It's not a traditional way to describe philosophy. Uh, and there'll be plenty of philosophers around who object to that as a definition of what philosophy is. But there we go. Uh, philosophy is the creation of concepts. That's our starting point for, for, for dealing with, um, with Deleuze and Gattari. And if we look at how concepts are created, they're, they're forged when we need them, because we need them. We need a new way of thinking about a situation, and so we come up with it. Now, when Deleuze and Gattari are talking about concepts, they tend to be talking in the realm of philosophy, and so they'll be talking about Plato inventing concepts or Spinoza inventing concepts. Uh, that, that's what philosophers do. But as architects, you very often need a much more practical kind of idea. Uh, and, and we too can create concepts, uh, but they're, they tend to be more practically grounded. But notice the problems that we have depend on the ecology in which we live. So for me, as an architect, say, it doesn't do a lot of good to obsess about the kinds of problems that philosophers have. They're different problems that they focus on and spend their lives trying to, trying to sort out, trying to come up with uh, some resolution to, to, to a problem. Uh, and I can read philosophy and I can, can be engaged with the, the kind of discussion. But what, what I want to learn from the kind of discussion that philosophers have is not necessarily the solution to their problems, but how to think so that I can think about my problems, which have a bearing on how I want to live and the, the circumstances that I'm in. But then notice, once a concept has been invented, you can learn what it is and you can move it to, to a new place. It can be re-territorialized. And of course, here they're, they're, they're talking about um, philosophical ideas being moved from one place to, to, to another, uh, and the misprision of, um, of something, the theft of an idea from one domain to, to, to another is something that happens regularly all the time and creatively. And that's what they mean when they say that the concept becomes nomadic. It's detached from the circumstances of its original invention and made into something that will travel, something portable, if you like, some, something that you can make use of when you find that you're in a situation that, uh, that, that, that can use it. Um, and, and you find the, these kinds of ideas used in, in all sorts of different, different settings now. Um, the, the idea of an ecology has become 
the, the, the dominant one for talking about these complex interactions of, of different ideas which, which, uh, which do interact, but perhaps in unpredictable, unpredictable ways. And they're all involved in a world of ideas. They have an impact on one another. And um, yeah, and ecology feels like a, a good word to, to set, set up that, um, uh, to, to, to describe what, what, what's going on. That there are other words like politics, which mean the same thing in, in their hands. Um, the, the books I put up here, uh, Nomadic Theory, Post-Human Ecologies, the, the one that matters most to me is the, uh, the, the one down below there, the architectures of life and death. We, we just had a book launch for that yesterday in, in, in Delft. Uh, so that's, that, that's the most recent. But look, he, here's uh, Felix Gattari right, right, with his book, The Three Ecologies, which came out in 1989. Uh, the Three Ecologies briefly are ecology of natural history, that, that's the one that you think about um, when ecology is mentioned in uh, you know, the concept of uh, it, it, in the uh, in connection with preserving nature and living harmoniously together. But then his second ecology is social ecology, which is exactly what we would normally call politics. But, but actually, in, in Deleuze and Gattari's world, politics can refer not only to the interrelations inter between people, but also the interrelations between particle, particles, molecules. That there's one of Gattari's early books is called Molecular Revolution. Um, and and there, there's uh, John Protevi's book about um, uh, Gattari's physics. It, they, they really do mean um, molecular interactions at, at, in an atomic sort of way. But then that translates up to the, the kind of practical politics at, at uh, interpersonal and national level and planetary level. Um, and, and in between, there's something goes on within the individual, which they call micropolitics, uh, which is a uh, I can say as a shorthand, it's a replacement for um, psychology, if you like. But then we get the, the third ecology, the ecology of ideas, which I'll enlarge upon uh, next. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, the term minds comes in there because it, it's, that, that's the ordinary language word that we might use to, to describe it, except that that idea of mind is problematized and made mobile and gets, gets to be used in, in different ways by the time we've finished. So from Arne Ness, the uh, Norwegian environmentalist, uh, Gattari picks up the term ecosophy. Uh, he wrote a book called Kes Good ecosophy. What is ecosophy? And, and then uh, Gregory Bateson, really important for understanding um, Deleuze and Gattari, especially in their Thousand Plateaus. The, the idea of a Thousand Plateaus comes from a Bateson essay uh, about Balinese culture, the culture of the steady state. Um, and he talks about the ecology of ideas in this collection of essays, uh, steps towards an ecology of mind. And mind is Bateson's word for an ecology. Uh, they, they, um, in some circumstances, they're interchangeable words. But he, here's Bateson. This, this is the epigraph from the three ecologies. So we're looking at a, a printed page of Gattari here, translated. Um, but he's 
setting things in motion by looking to Bates and saying there is an ecology of bad ideas, just as there is an ecology of weeds. And basically, we, we've uh, got to we've got to deal with that. Um, let, let's see what happens when you make the epistemological error of choosing the wrong unit. You end up with the species versus the other species around it or versus the environment in which it operates. So instead of seeing it as an ecology where everything has to cooperate, you see things as being in competition and you imagine that it might be a good idea to wipe something out. So here we have man against nature. You end up in fact with a polluted bay in Lake Erie where it all goes a slimy green mess uh, because of the uh, it's, it's, it's because of um, uh, nitrates getting in, in, into the water, fer fertilizing is getting into the water. So bad ideas in include the idea of building bigger atom bombs to kill off the next door neighbors. It's characteristic of the system that basic error propagates itself. It branches out like a rooted parasite through the tissues of life. And everything gets into a rather peculiar mess. So we, we don't live in isolation. We connect with the things around us and we must live in, in, in connection with everything in our ecology. And, and so he's talking here about the ecosophic object. Um, it, it's, um, what, the way Bateson expresses it is that the, the unit of survival is not the individual organism, it's the organism plus habitat. And we need to have a way of thinking that sees that organism plus habitat as the unit. But that's an unusual thing to do. You know, we need to think of things in terms of ecologies, so the ecology is the unit. Um, not the, the isolated individual. And we don't look just to maximize profits and destroy the planet. We, we look, at, look, look for a, a balance of things. Now this is, uh, this slide is put in to signal the change of year. You, you'll remember that um, Deleuze also wrote about the Baroque in connection with Leibniz. But, but the thing I liked about that was that it's making visible ideas of gods and things going on in the heavens, which are not normally visible, but are often in people's heads. They're, uh, they're, they're we're haunted by all sorts of ideas that, that we don't fully articulate, but we're, we have to deal with them when we're talking with other people. Um, now, just try to make this, this concrete in connection with a couple of architectural examples. Uh, I've got here the, the Farnsworth House, which you probably recognize by Mies van der Rohe from the middle of the 20th century, a very high profile, iconic building. Uh, and then this building is perhaps less well known as a building, but it, it's very well known in literature. It, it, it's the, the hut that Thoreau built by Walden Pond, which is the, uh, the, the place he was living in for a, a, about a year when he wrote Walden, which is one of the great foundational texts of ecological thinking. But when we look at Mises' the pavilion for Edith Farnsworth, we tend to see it as a perfect self-contained little object. It, it, it's uh, very reductive in, in its architectural language. So we see eight columns, four on each side, the, 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 the plateaus that make the floor and, and, and the roof, and the, the glazing which barely contains the, the, the activities within. It looks like a minimal intervention in, in the landscape 
and makes for a support that you would think puts the inhabitant very closely in touch with the surroundings. But if we start to, to look at what's involved with making that house work, you, you see that there's all kinds of connections are, are necessary. I mean, first of all, the car, it doesn't begin to work without a vehicle to, to, to get there. Uh, and also it's connected to, to Maine's services. Uh, there, there's one of the posts going down into the ground, uh, 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 a four inch tube goes down into the ground from beneath the, the central core of the house and all the services go, go into it through, through that. So it doesn't get expressed in the architecture, but nevertheless, it, the house could not function without the connection to the nuclear power station nearby and the, the, the treatment works for the, the, the water. It, it, Here's the satellite view of the house uh, on the left there. And you s can you make out that the house itself is just below the blue dot. And you see in order to, to, to make the, the glass walls work, you need a certain amount of space outside this uh, forest uh, to, to screen the, the, the views from, uh, from, from the surroundings, from the road. So it gives you a decent amount of privacy. At least that was the intention. They didn't reckon on the determination of architecture students. So the, uh, the client found herself often waking up uh, with cameras looking in through her windows and she was very upset about it all. She actually sued the architect. She said the house was uninhab uninhabitable for various reasons. Uh, and here down the river, there, there's the sewage treatment plant that, that the house is, is connected to. So it, it, it doesn't work as a, an isolated thing. You need not only the, the, the bit that we focus on as the, the beautiful minimal architecture, you also need the, the support of the, um, the, the, the things that produce the, the, the services. And then if we look at the materials, uh, those were not feasible before the middle of the, the 20th century to, to be used in a domestic environment. The, 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 those large sheets of plate glass are made by floating molten glass on a bed of molten tin, which is denser, so the glass floats on it. Uh, and it makes this beautiful polished surface that, that you, you, you see right through. But just look at how heavy that machiner, machinery is. Think about how much energy go, goes into the, the production and how, how far removed we are from the, the, the earlier stages in the, the development of the world. Uh, the, that little house has the backup of all, all this kind of thing going on. Here, here's the, the, the steel works making the I-beams, which arrive on the back of a lorry. Uh, but you need this really heavy machinery, which can also be, I mean, it's also there be, behind the production of armaments and you, you name it, but it, it's um, heavy industrial uh, pr production that is needed to to get these building products uh, to where your front door is going to be. So that little house could not be built in just any society. It needs this industrial complex to be up and running before you can even think of putting putting that in place. So there's an uh, an ecology of what? Not not only ideas, but of of, uh, of raw materials being processed in very heavy duty ways in order to make that kind of simplicity. Now, by contrast, Thor Thoreau's hut has been of no great interest to 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 architects, but perhaps it should be 
but he, he opens his, his book with a, a chapter called Economy, which, which is uh, you know, the, the, the root word uh, of economy is ecos, which is the, is the home. Uh, but but he, he means to, to, to think about e uh, economy in a political sort of way uh, as well. And he points out that if he had borrowed the money from the bank to buy the farm that he very nearly did buy, then he would be spending the rest of his career plowing the fields and spending hours of drudgery in the fields in order to pay back the bank this loan. So instead of that, he thinks about how he can live more simply. And here's his breakdown of his costs, totaling $28.12.5 um, to, 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 to build this little hut. And he lived genuinely very close to, to nature. He, he recorded uh, what, what went on when he was living in, in this hut. Uh, and it, 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 you know, it involves talking to the birds and watching the buds open and, and so on. He, he, he was uh, a, a lot closer to, to, to nature uh, and to the, the immediate environment. He, he doesn't make calls on the, on the wider world. He does once he, once he starts writing and, and publishing, he, he quotes Homer and you, you, you get a, uh, you, you find that he, he was living on the proceeds of his uh, family's pencil factory and he was walking back to see them on, on Sundays to get a square meal um, down, down the railway track, which wasn't so far from the house. So it, it's a, a, a more complex story than I'm, I'm presenting. But nevertheless, it, it's um, a, a radically simple uh, and, and economically frugal way to, to live. Now, so, so yeah, he, he's looking at ideas that help him to live in, in that frugal sort of way so that his impact on the earth is no, no greater than it should be. He's not so much doing it for environmental reasons as for reasons that are much more pious than that. It, it, he's wanting to be at one with, uh, with, with God's creation. A and he's wanting not to be trapped by society. He, he's, um, he, he, he insisted on being put in prison at one point. He wasn't paying his, his taxes because he refused to pay taxes to, to a state where it was legal to, to keep slaves, as it, as it was in the South. And uh, he, he insisted on being put into prison. One of his aunts paid his fine and he was kicked out. But, but there, there's ideas about his relation to society that, that are, are uh, problematic in, in, in his own eyes. Uh, and I like this slide because it makes the connection very nicely between the, the kinds of ecology of ideas that uh, Gattari is talking about and consciousness. Uh, humans are nature becoming conscious of herself, uh, saying any safe clues. Uh, and it's, um, uh, it, 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 it's a vision of humans as part of the ecosphere, part, part of life on Earth. And, and we start seeing various conceptualizations of people as particles, as matter, um, which needs to develop a kind of consciousness that makes sense in, in a collective way. It's an emergent um, awakeness to uh, what, what's going on. And here we have some crowds of people behaving in fairly organized ways. But if we think of them as particles uh, engaged in interpersonal po political sorts of ways, then we begin to see something of 
the, 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 the vision that Deleuze and Gattari can help us to articulate when we're thinking about how we might live. Today I'm going to be looking oh, at sorry. Deleuze and Gattari's ideas. Sorry, <clears throat> I, I hadn't realized it was on repeat. Um, so uh, that was a wonderful contribution by Andrew. Um, and what was nice about it in many ways is that he was um, celebrating Guattari, who's often overlooked and certainly was in Rethinking Architecture. We only had uh, Deleuze's name there. Um, it's it's great to to have Helen here today. Um, Helen is in Melbourne, Australia. Um, Helen, nice to say, I, I was, was in Europe for a while, was teaching in KTH in Stockholm. Um, uh, and prior to that, she was in RMIT, but now she's at the University of Melbourne, where she is a professor of architecture and philosophy. Helen, it's it's great to to welcome you here. Um, great to have such a distinguished voice um, uh, here. And uh, um, would you like to, to share your screen? Okay, I'll do that. Shall I just launch in? Yes, launch straight in. Why not? Yes. Oh, okay. Just, you know, I'm going to follow your lead here. All right. Uh, okay, everyone can see that? Yes. All good. All right, because I am sitting in Nam or Melbourne, as it's known to settler colonials, it's very important for me to commence by acknowledging the Indigenous elders past, present and emerging, which happen to be the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation where I'm sitting. So I pay my respects, uh, you know, to their incredible enduring um, care for country here down under. And with that, I'm going to launch into this task that Neil has given me to introduce Deleuze. And I suspect that um, in preparing for this, I've overprepared and I'm hoping that, uh, that I, won't, I won't go on endlessly. What I've done is I've created something of a field guide of concepts. You'll have heard already from Andrew Ballantyne and you'll have heard um, Neil speaking of the importance of the construction of concepts as, a, as one of the most um, uh, powerful means of producing philosophy, let's say. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to introduce you to a series of concepts that I've gleaned from Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari's work. And I'm going to speak to this um, by way of orientating my own work, which travels through first architecture and then philosophy, where I hold my PhD, I'll speak of Deleuze as something of a mediator, a, a, a conceptual persona who's helped me think uh, through the various problems or problematic fields that I've attempted to navigate in my career. Now, so hence Deleuze, my mediator, thinking with Deleuze. Uh, this is going to be a field guide of concepts, and that field guide is going to be arranged according to instructions, diagrams, and formulae. Um, so we'll see how, how well that works as we proceed. Now, um, you'll have heard from Andrew Ballantyne that uh, uh, Deleuze and Guattari, uh, well, they're prolific, as you can see here. And um, I think there's a book missing on the end that's sitting here, uh, a more recent book called Letters and Other Texts Gathering um, Letters from Deleuze. But uh, you'll see this remarkable body of work that I've organised here for your benefit um, in chronological order according to, hmm, well, I've done French publication dates on, on, on the bottom and um, translated into English on the top. And you'll notice that with Deleuze and Guattari, there's, of course, Anti-Oedipus and then Thousand Plateaus. But um, added to that, don't forget, uh, in between those two works, um, Kafka to water minor literature is another piece. So it is impressive seeing it all lined up here. I, I, I Maybe there's something missing. I'm not sure. I was in my office um, for the first time in a while lately because we've been under such long lockdown conditions. Um, so I was sort of trying to put them in order. There's also, of course, a proliferating body of secondary literature on Deleuze. And so, you know, this is just a small snapshot, including people like Paul Patton. You can't see Elizabeth Gross here, but she's a very important, um, you know, early commentator on Deleuze. Rosie Bray Dotti, uh, Simon O'Sullivan, anyway, um, Ronald Bogue, uh, and so on and so forth, Anne Sauvignag. 
um, really important people who are, well, many of these are uh, people bringing Deleuze to an Anglophone audience. And then, of course, there's the proliferation of series with Edinburgh University Press, uh, with whom I've worked on first Deleuze and Architecture and then Deleuze and the City, um, introducing Deleuze to the slightly distinct, though overlapping audiences of architecture and urban studies, I suppose one could say. But this, too, is a proliferating series of ands. You know, um, you can put Deleuze with anything, uh, th th this series would seem to suggest. One might also um, offer cautionary sort of warnings about what this proliferation might mean in terms of um, the marketplace of publishing. All right, but given what we've heard already from Neil and Andrew, uh, this proliferation of concepts, this mode of nomadic thinking, this rhizomatic interconnection of everything, it's, it's, it's actually quite challenging to know where to start with Deleuze. So where does one start? Um, well, we must include the story of his friendship and collaboration with Felix Guattari. I'm not going to go into, into that too much today. Um, but uh, if one were to ask Deleuze, Deleuze would simply start, you know, challenge us to start from the midst of things, to just get into something, to get going, to commence par le milieu from the, the field or suite of ecological relations uh, that you find yourself in the midst of. This is also something that Isabel Stengers, who's a big reader of Deleuze and who I've been working, whose work I've been using as a point of inspiration recently stresses. You must start par le milieu with your feet on the ground, looking to the problems that you directly um, face in understanding their local sort of implications, understanding their more complex global uh, interconnections. <clears throat> And then uh, once you get going, uh, you've got to understand there's a certain orientation that's required of you. And this is a refrain that we find repeatedly throughout Deleuze's work and also in his collaboration with um, Guattari. It's a sort of non-representational emphasis. It's a challenge to habits of um, signification denotation and connotation, and that is their uh, insistence that it's not a question of meaning, it's a matter of use. So what do I mean by this? There's a whole array of uh, quotes that we find from across Deleuze and Guattari's work where they stress again and again it's uh, anything you want it, want it to be so long as it works. It means nothing, but it works. It's anything provided we make the whole thing work, and it works, believe me. The modern work of art has no problem of meaning, it has only a problem of use. And again and again, we hear this refrain, it's not a question of meaning, it's a matter of use. It's what we're going to do about things. Uh, so it's not about uh, spending time reflecting and even sort of thinking, um, though, of course, <laughs> I should be wary of what I'm saying there because, of course, of course, certain modes of the construction of thought are fundamental to Deleuze. But you'll have noticed in the early videos that Neil showed that he's, he's kind of arguing against the task of the philosopher being that to reflect. It's about answering to problems um, as, as we greet them, and, and, and this is really fundamental. Um, to do that, though, we never think in isolation. There are always mediators with whom we think. So, you know, for me, Deleuze from probably around, I don't know, the, the early to mid-90s became this really powerful figure um, as I was working my way through architectural theory and then as, as I was venturing into philosophy and kind of starting a new undergrad degree um, running through philosophy. He, he's a, he is a very dangerous thinker. I was warned about him from many of my philosophy um, professors because he does have a habit of contaminating your mode of, of thinking. Uh, it's infectious, it's contagious. And he speaks himself about the importance of mediators, who we're thinking with, who are our conceptual friends. He argues that creation's all about mediators. Without them, nothing happens. They can be people. For a philosopher, artists or scientists, for a scientist, philosophers or artists, uh, but things too, even plants or animals. So um, here we have these primary figures that are emerging, uh, especially late um, in Deleuze and Guattari's collaboration. That is three 
primary disciplines and they received a lot of critique for that, philosophy, art and science. And for each of these uh, disciplinary modes, um, each of them are compelled to create in their own way uh, in answer to the, the problems that are specific to their fields. They think with each other, but they don't just think with other human subjectivities, they also think with things, they think with plants, they think with animals. Um, so mediators can be human and non-human is the message here. This is all of what we think with. But they're also composed of these figures that were introduced to very explicitly um, near the opening of the final collaborative work of Deleuze and Guattari in What is Philosophy? And that is aesthetic figures. So we think with aesthetic figures, the figures that we pick up from literature, from film, for instance, um, we step into their shoes, we undertake uh, kind of acts of becoming with them, thinking with them, feeling with them. Um, uh, the, these are the sympathies that we form um, when we're affected by different aesthetic um, encounters. Alongside aesthetic figures, there are conceptual personae who are a little bit different. Here, these are the people that we think with in terms of, let's say, philosophy or our theoretical or disciplinary field. Uh, conceptual personae for Deleuze and Guattari are uh, the characters who sign concepts. Um, so we can think of, uh, you know, Descartes' famous concept, I think, therefore I am. Here's a conceptual persona who signed that. But that's not to say that the concept belongs to him. He creates it. And then if he's responsible or, you know, any philosopher, um, then the idea is to pass the concept on and see uh, what its applications might be elsewhere in other fields. We heard Andrew Ballantyne talking about this as a kind of nomadology of the concept, that we pick it up, uh, we deterritorialize it, we re-territorialise it depending on the particular problems um, that we're coping with. But of course, when we're engaging with these aesthetic figures and these conceptual personae, it's important not to remain passive receivers. We have to undertake active um, construction. Uh, Deleuze's philosophy is often described as a form of constructivism. It, it you know, uh, uh, impels us again and again to construct concepts. But in engaging with, you know, aesthetic figures, conceptual personae, uh, pre-existing concepts that we're wanting to tackle, the problems on the ground that we're wanting to deal with, part of the um, uh, aim is, uh, perhaps it's even in inevitable, uh, but is not simply to sort of um, recuperate, but to restore an incomparable novelty um, is what Deleuze and Guattari argue to those personae problems, fields that we're encountering. Rather than merely offering commentary somewhere between construction and destruction, it may also be possible to restore an incomparable novelty to our predecessors. Um, I quote this in one of my recent books, Creative Ecologies. Uh, this is about bringing something very novel to the connections we're making uh, between, um, you know, the concepts of prior thinkers or, um, or artists, let's say. Uh, in thinking with them, we create something new in that process. Uh, if we're doing our job right, we could say. Now, so that's something of a preamble. Um, what I want to do is lead you now through these three sections around uh, instructions, diagrams and formulae. And my argument is that we find... Um, uh, the work of Deleuze is often articulated in these modes. It's something that I've been reflecting on um, recently. So, for instance, we hear these instructions such as construct concepts. If you're a philosopher, uh, your job is to construct concepts. Uh, but, of course, this is very specifically sort of um, qualified because, importantly, all concepts are connected to problems without which they would have no meaning and which can themselves only be isolated or understood as their solution emerges. So again, Andrew touched on this. We construct concepts that are pertinent to the field that we're dealing with. Some concepts call for archaisms and others for neologisms shot through with almost crazy etymological exercises. Etymology is like a specifically philosophical athleticism. In each case, there must be a strange necessity for these words and for their choice, like an element of style. 
Deleuze and Guattari, of course, are really known for their invention of concepts and for their use of neologisms or invented words, because sometimes the problems that we're dealing with require new words in order to sort of uh, get a grip on them, we could say. So construct concepts, this is a primary instruction that we're given in a way. But we find instructions elsewhere in Deleuze and Guattari's work as well. For instance, famously in Plateau 6 of A Thousand Plateaus, how do you make yourself a body without organs, which um, includes a sadomasochistic um, routine. In fact, um, Deleuze has also written on Sasha, Sasha, Sasha Masoch and has um, discussed sadomasochism in, in a dedicated book earlier in his career. So here we find very specific instructions uh, that Deleuze and Guattari relate uh, toward, you know, how one can sort of undo the organisation of a body and um, rethink uh, what a body can do. Uh, so instructions are sort of a, a crucial part of engaging in one's subject formation in relation to one's world, in relation to one into others. And uh, they, they call on us again and again to sort of get going relative to our own problems um, in terms of the body without organs. They suggest you already have one or several. Uh, it's not so much that it pre-exists or come, comes ready-made, though in some senses it's pre-existent. In any way, uh, your responsibility is to make one. You can't desire without making one that is a body without organs. And it awaits you. It's an inevitable exercise or experimentation. Already accomplished the moment you undertake it, unaccomplished as long as you don't. This is not reassuring because you can botch it. So this becomes part of their sort of generalised call to create concepts, again, that re relate to problems and that your whole embodied sort of, you know, subject formation is enrolled and involved in these, these pro problem formations, which places you very much at risk. Now, this notion of instructions and this kind of, um, you know, a call to kind of get going, this imperative that we hear in Deleuze and Guattari's work, which is not just an aesthetic imperative, but also very much a political imperative, um, inspired this little book. So I'm, I'm also here as we proceed intersecting with various of um, the works that I've published recently, which is very much driven, inspired by how do you make yourself a body without organs and then driven around a series of steps uh, where I invite um, readers to sort of engage what, uh, to invent what their um, feminist design power tool might be. And it is important to mention that there has been a powerful strain of thought coming out of Deleuze that's influenced feminist theory and gender. Claire Colebrook has been an important um, thinker. Uh, she's an Australian um, a scholar who uh, has written two introductions to Deleuze, um, introducing Deleuze to an Anglophone audience. So feminist theory and gender forms an important part of, uh, of what we can do with Deleuze and with Guattari too. Here too, we see more of these sort of proliferating publications that I was drawing your attention to earlier. We have famously the rhizome. We've already heard about it. I don't need to sort of um, go into that, but this is another form of instruction that is organised powerfully around a series of um, uh, principles. You know, so so while there's a sort of sense of a, a wild journey that's taken uh, whenever you kind of enter into the work of Deleuze and Guattari, and it becomes especially wild when it's a collaboration because Guattari's voice is even more frenetic uh, than Deleuze's voice. Um, in fact, Francois does in um, the double biography of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari called Intersecting Lives talks about how in some ways um, uh, Guattari's voice is a sort of a hyper interactive voice where ideas are kind of coming through a stream of consciousness they're here and there and everywhere and Deleuze comes in with a kind of this this smoother flow of um or well mm, maybe it's a striating flow of the philosopher trying to organize and um weave back in certain philosophical concepts uh so there's a there's a very particular dynamic in the Deleuze and Guattari um you know long-term relationship one further um, instruction that's very fundamental um, to Deleuze and Guattari and that helps us intersect also uh, with architecture quite powerfully would be the imperative to follow the, the material. 
Um, in A Thousand Plateaus, they take wood as an example, and they speak of how a craftsperson follows the wood um, rather than tries to push it against what it's capable of doing. This is the anti-hylomorphic approach that um, you've heard about already through Andrew. So don't impose a form, instead surrender to the wood, follow it closely to see what it needs, what it can do, and follow it closely to see what it connects you to. Do not assume a fixed form and a matter deemed homogenous. Instead, acknowledge the variable undulations and torsions of the fibres guiding the operation of sp splitting wood. Here I've mixed up quotes from Deleuze and Guattari in a, in a recent essay I've written engaging in this idea of following the material. Something that's really important to understand about this imperative to follow the material, it's not just about a sensitivity to what material can do, which hooks us up further into sort of global supply chains and our irresponsible extraction of resources as well. Um, and, you know, raising consciousness around that. Uh, it's, it's very much a sort of ethical um, imperative to follow the material is to adequately engage in um, environmental and, or ecological relations. I, I go further into this in this little um, book called Dirty Theory, Troubling Architecture. And this imperative to follow the material is the concluding step, in fact, of um, that previous little pink book, How to Make Yourself a Feminist Design Power Tool. One, one final sort of um, suite of instructions that um, uh, we find in Deleuze, and these are just sa samples. You can find them everywhere. So I'm, I'm literally kind of grabbing and um, throwing at you examples of the instructions um, and imperatives that we find running through Deleuze and also Deleuze and Guattari's work. And I've been very fascinated across a few essays and in my book, Creative, uh, Creative Ecologies, with Deleuze, what I call Deleuze's methodology of exhaustion, which he um, articulates in his reading of uh, Samuel Beckett's television plays, uh, where he looks, uh, he starts with the notion of the combinations of uh, combin combinatorials of, of things in series, including images, concepts, and things. Then he proceeds into a second phase of the drying up or exhausting of, of voices and a third stage, in fact, I divide the third stage into two parts, the extenuation of the potentialities of space. So we have the exhaustion of space. And then a fourth part, which is the exhaustion of the image of thought or the power of the image of thought. The image of thought for Deleuze, which is a crucial concept that appears in a number of places, but um, is to be found uh, right at the centre of difference and repetition, um, is basically uh, the hegemony, the status quo, uh, the way we're apt to think in a particular way, especially collectively, um, you know, when we think of thought distributed at the scale of a population. The image of thought is that which constrains us and which, following the sort of nomadological um, moves of, of Deleuze and Guattari, is what we have to escape from. Though, of course, as once at the moment we break the image of thought, we're as likely to return um, to the composition of yet a new one. The idea, though, is to escape dogmatism uh, when it breaks us up. So exhaustion is, is this sort of both conceptual and corporeal uh, process that we must escape from, but which can also uh, impel us toward creative possibility, which is something that another um, thinker with Deleuze, Peter Pal, um, Pelpart, talks about in his cartography of exhaustion. For me, exhaustion has been a, a theme that's run through as an undercurrent in creative ecologies, theorising the practice of architecture, where each of the parts in the book dedicated to environment worlds, things and thinkables, uh, conclude with a meditation on exhaustion. And I'll come back to this also when I conclude. And Neil's going to have to shout out at me if I go to, if I'm spending too much time. This is really like, this is my rip-roaring run through a bunch of things here. All right, so the second part that I wanted to look at with Deleuze, and we come very close to architecture here too, is under this notion of diagrams, which we find again and again throughout Deleuze's work. And I've, I've written quite a bit on the diagram and or processes of diagramming as it relates to Deleuze. And we can include under... Um, the we can include under the 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 concept of diagrams such concepts as 
smooth, striated and holy space, territorialization, deterritorialization and re-territorialization or the geophilosophy of Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari, uh, the virtual and the actual or processes of actualization, notions such as continuous variation, each of which has a kind of diagrammatic force behind them. In fact, Neil earlier was talking about the sort of uh, um, the binary concepts that Deleuze are, are undoes, such as sedentary and nomadic and so forth. But we as often find triptychs of concepts in Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari's work. So it's not just the smooth and striated, but the smooth, the striated and holy space. It's not just territorialization and deterritorialization, but re-territorialization again and so forth. But obviously one of the most um, well-known concepts that's hit architecture uh, at a certain point in the mid-90s was this powerful concept of the fold or le pli in French that you've already heard about. Now, in fact, um, it's actually not terribly interesting to talk about folding in architecture, and I've spent quite a lot of time um, critiquing it. Uh, there's a tendency um, to take the fold as concept and apply it uh, to an architecture, assuming that architecture is what looks like. So we have Eisenman's planar folds. We have perhaps uh, Greg Lynn's, you know, fat folds, embryological folds. But this is about the fold in terms of what it looks like, as though we could apply it so simply uh, to an architectural problem. When in fact, as we've heard Neil mention, um, the fold is so much more. Um, it does so much more. Uh, it's not it's not only an aesthetic gesture, it's very much a political gesture. It's about the formation of subjectivities. It's about points of view. It's about situations. It's about a kind of whole calculus of the situation, situating of perhaps a subject, human or non-human, in light of their ecological relations. So, you know, I'm I'm totally jiving with um, Andrew Ballantyne in terms of this emphasis on the ecological or geophilosophy that we can find with Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read out this quote, but we get the mobility of, 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 of processes of subjectivity as they come into encounter with environments, mobile points of view, whereby um, it's less the notion of a pre-given or defined subject. In fact, the subject for Deleuze is what comes to the point of view rather than what remains in the point of view, point of view and subject formed together in light of environmental encounters and objects and subjects in their relations under constant processes of transformation or becoming, as we've heard from Neil. What is often overlooked, though, in that architectural reception history of the fold is that uh, just a little bit before, just a couple of years before Deleuze published the fold, um, Leibniz and the Baroque, he published his book dedicated to Foucault. And we find the work of the fold at work in both of these um, rather slim but dense volumes. And I would argue, and I have, that it's important to read them alongside each other. Uh, and here we have a you know, Deleuze not only speaks of diagrams in terms of their kind of dynamics and the power that circulates through them, but draws his own suite of diagrams. And we have in his discussion of Foucault this very special diagram that I myself have done a lot of work on um, in terms of this notion, again, of the zone of subjectiv subjectivation, um, the fold itself, plea number four, uh, generated um, in the proximity of, uh, of um, uh, the strata of the, of the archive, as well as the strategic zone of current activity, and then in relation to a, an entirely sort of contingent outside. So this whole dynamism of, of, in a way, we can relate this to power and knowledge, an established archive of knowledge, an established epistemology, um, current thinking as it's being dealt with, dealing with contemporary problems, and then a radically open outside of, you know, anything could happen next in a way and how all of these uh, work together to create this uh, fold of the interior that's also a fold of the outside, um, which we can imagine as something that's multiplied uh, right across something like a plane of imminence. So we can take the diagram from Deleuze intersect with it and multiply it to see something of a perhaps social or ecological phenomenon that we can extrapolate from this 
powerful concept of the fold, which leads us further to this very, um, well, a concept that is a warning that we find in the very late work of Deleuze where he writes um, an essay called Postscript on Societies of Control. And we've heard a little bit about this notion of control uh, that Neil has already introduced. Uh, so we find not only the fold, but also the concept of um, the superfold, which I write about myself um, in Deleuze and Guattari in an essay called um, Deleuze and the Story of the Superfold. Um, uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to go into this in depth, except to reiterate some of Neil's discussion on the question of control that Deleuze is warning us about late in his career with his essay postscript on societies of control, uh, where he's also um, picking up on categories from uh, Foucault in, in terms of um, engaging with uh, man's life, labour and language and how these come to be sort of organised in societies of control, the society of control famously being that which is supposed to follow after um, uh, Foucault's definition of disciplinary societies. If disciplinary societies set us up in kind of cubicles and separate us out, out according to a spatial order, uh, the danger of the control society is that we no longer even read that spatial containment because we've thoroughly um, internalised it. Uh, we've taken it on in terms of our production and consumption of data. Um, we have environments that are prepared just in advance of us because we've, uh, you know, fed our iPhones all the information about which uh, restaurant we like to order Uber Eats from, you know, so we're given prompts constantly um, and we've become these coded individuals, individual being um, a concept more specifically from Guattari. Uh, uh, and our work is sort of perpetually in, in progress, but we've sort of lost sight of what we can do collaboratively. We've become these sort of small nodes organised through the flows of data that have more control of, over us than we have over, you know, it, this sort of organisation of data. You know all the controversies uh, around how data is being used in dangerous ways. Uh, which is not to say that we can't revolutionise um, data. Now, rather than, rather than um, you know, the habitual place to go when we look at Deleuze and architecture is to go straight to the fold um, as a key concept and to talk about, you know, characters like Lynn and Eisenman, but there's another much more interesting story going on here uh, that's introduced at the opening of Deleuze and Guattari by uh, my colleague Karen Burns, uh, where she introduces a totally other character into the picture of the reception of Deleuze, at least into a, um, an American context, um, when Deleuze is sort of uh, becoming a thinker that's being uh, picked up on. Uh, the work specifically of Jennifer Bloomer, who, you know, um, basically a year before Folding in Architecture comes out, has published Architecture in the Texts the scripts of Joyce and Piranesi. And in this book, um, as well as elsewhere, uh, she's not just introducing Deleuze, she's also introducing Derrida, she's introducing Hélène Sixou, she's introducing um, uh, Walter Benjamin, a whole range of thinkers uh, to an architectural audience conducting her own kind of constructivism, bringing theory and practice in architecture together. And crucially in this book, architecture and the text, uh, which arrives on the scene, you know, uh, before folding in architecture, she's introducing Deleuze and Guattari's um, concept of a minor literature and intersecting that with them um, on other fronts too. Uh, she's in search of a minor architecture. And of course, a feminist trajectory is important to her work. Um, uh, she has some of her own diagrams that I won't go into here that ring out with a kind of material semiotics, putting material relations and um, forms of kind of the construction of signs and concepts into contact uh, with each other. Um, 
right now uh, with a number of colleagues, we're actually putting together a special issue of Journal of Architecture dedicated to the legacy of Bloomer, um, picking up on this other character who was very hot in the uh, late 80s and early 90s and sort of disappeared off the scene, but is a, a crucial um, figure by which we can imagine another genealogy of the influence and legacy of Deleuze in, in architecture. So uh, this cut that um, Bloom is introducing here also leads me to, um, I'm still in diagrams. I don't think I can run you through the irrational sec section cut, which was going to be another diagram I was going to uh, tell you about. But if you're interested, you can look at this um, in the book After Effects. Uh, the idea being that we can take up conventions of architecture, uh, such as the section cut, and challenge their normative structures. Uh, I borrow the irrational section cut from Deleuze's um, Cinema 2 image where he's talking about post-war cinema and how sound and movement become deranged from each other. That leads us on to the third section, which is the closing section on formulae. So as much as we have uh, instructions and imperatives, um, as well as diagrams and processes of diagramming in the work of Deleuze, um, which is as much about power as organising things, uh, well, those two are connected together, we have these formulae or these oft-repeated phrases or these refrains, as uh, Deleuze and Guattari call them, or ritonellos. Um, for instance, where Deleuze reads Herman Melville's short story, Bartleby the Scrivener, he spends a lot of time talking about the formula that Bartleby enunciates, a form of refusal to that which is oppressive in the present, with the small phrase, which is neither to say yes nor no, simply I would prefer not to, when asked to continue in his um, banal job on Wall Street. We have all the formula uh, where Deleuze reads uh, the um, 17th century Dutch Jewish philosopher and lens grinder Baruch Spinoza, the formula whereby we place experience alongside experimentation. All experimentation is about uh, the experience that us as processes of subjectification and becoming are entering into. So another formula, how experience and experiment are bound together. We have Again, engaging in um, Spinoza, uh, the reciprocal uh, for, formula of uh, to affect and to be affected. And this is a formula that is also pertinent to the notion of becoming that Neil introduced us to. Um, affect theory has become quite a large domain um, influenced by Deleuze, his reading of Spinoza and coming in through another, uh, a bunch of different things. And um, being picked up in architecture too, in sometimes troubling ways, as Douglas Spencer has argued in his book on architecture and neoliberalism. But affect is, a, is about capacity, capacity to affect the other, to be affected, capacity to be in the world in a particular way based on what we're capable of doing. And again, the formula with which I began, that is not a question of meaning but a matter of use, which places attention on um, a particular orientation to matter as material flow, as dynamic, as engaged in the particular problems that we want to uh, deal with. Um, and we can hear this even uh, these formulae in sort of in kind of in the territorial moves that Deleuze and Guattari uh, describe to us. Um, this this beautiful phrase from of the refrain: um, "A child in the dark, gripped with fear, comforts himself by singing under his breath. He walks and halts to his song. Lost, he takes shelter or orients himself with his little song as best he can. The song is like a rough sketch of a calming and stabilizing, calm and stable sense." in the heart of chaos. So what we find here is the song is a refrain, it's a formula that helps the child orient himself and create something of shelter or a refugia, we could, a form of refuge, we could argue, and I have argued <laughs> elsewhere. And this, okay, this is, this is basically my two closing slides. Um, hope I haven't gone too terribly over time, where again, you know, late in Deleuze's career, he's writing that very 
haunting essay postscript on societies of control, warning us of a future that we're now uh, very familiar with in terms of uh, perhaps the more um, uh, oppressive aspects of, of um, data worlds. Um, but at around the same time, he's also writing this fleeting and beautiful short essay called Imminence, A Life, and he leaves off with this ellipses, this kind of open-endedness, returning us back to a, a particular sort of onto-epistemological field that um, he wants us to get, you know, kind of vibrate with in a way, this uh, becoming with, um, you know, environment worlds, this sort of uh, embeddedness in, in that basic unit of survival from, um, you know, Gregory Bateson of, you know, organism and environment working together. Uh, interestingly, in this one of his final um, essays, if not his final essay, uh, there is an unfortunate thing um, that happens in the English um, translation. Um, I think I'll just skip over that, where uh, he talks of the Spinozist concept of beatitude, which relates to Spinoza's third level of knowledge. Um, and in this fight, what this short essay, when it's translated into um, English, Imminence, A Life, uh, it, it, Beatitude is mistranslated as bliss, which has quite another definition. So in a way, we find at the close of his career, there's this sort of, um, it's as though he's sort of, uh, uh, he's introducing this plane of imminence, um, which he's trying to kind of, you know, surf or vibe with this sort of becoming imperceptible and this arrival at a state of, you know, I guess, um, secular beatitude uh, where you achieve, you know, the highest form of knowledge um, following Spinoza, a place at which you arrive but you must always depart from again, a refuge that uh, you can seek uh, but you'll find yourself having to exit again and again according to this nomadological logic uh, that we've been introduced to. So I think I'll conclude here with this challenging concept of beatitude. So Neil, that's yes. that's it for me, and we can um, we can of course go back through and unpack some of that because it was a bit, you know, it was it was a quick ride, but um, that's what I've got for you today. No, that was that was fantastic, wonderful. No, there was a lot of ideas there, and um, you know, I I, I no, I was that was fantastic. This is this is why we this platform is so incredible that we can. We have a global classroom now, and and to be able to to hear you, Helen, has been a real treat. I mean, really, um, and, and I, I, you know, I, 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 I to 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 meet to, to meet a real scholar of Deleuze rather than someone like myself trying to to make the most of it was fantastic. I also thought that Andrew's contribution was wonderful. So we've got the the start of a really interesting kind of conversation, and I'm hoping that people will. Um, uh, who are following us? We have both uh, the the live stream and also uh, a, a group here on on Zoom. We'll we'll um, we'll supply questions. <clears throat> um, we'll ask some questions. Maybe I've got one just to start things off. Um, I guess I, I and I uh, after the uh, when I was I um, uh, recorded that that the discussion with of uh, Andrew, we had a long discussion about the, the Greg Lynn thing and, the, and the, the fold AD. And, you know, I asked him, what do you think it's well as connection? He's got, he said, it's got absolutely no connection. But then we had a discussion about, about, you know, I introduced the concept, it comes from Harold Bloom. I don't know if you know this one, but it's a creative misunderstanding, which the idea is, is that, you know, in a way, um, you might understand some, misunderstand something, and, and and that's what architects do a lot, right? When it comes to philosophy, but you might be creative with it, which is of course what architects do as well, and the result is okay. You know, in the sense that you know maybe it might completely misunderstand what Deleuze is saying, but still you end up with something productive. And then um, Andrew brought in the the question about um, misprision, which he refers to also in terms of creativity. So I'm just wondering, you know, to 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 what extent maybe it's okay to get it completely wrong? You know, since you know. All forms of connaissance or uh, make connaissance, they're all, all forms of understanding, uh, misunderstandings. Um, and, and if you are opening up the possibility of, of, of this uh, concept being deterritorialized, and, and it's not about meaning, it's about use. You know? So, in some senses, I can see a kind of validation of the rather indulgent use of, of Deleuze uh, in, in, in those things. What, what do you think? 
No, no. Well, th- this is actually a really good point. Um, you know, when when I was a younger scholar and I, I'd, I'd finished my PhD in philosophy and I felt like I had the license to undertake the critique, then I was very happy, kind of like chopping into little pieces. You know, Greg Lynn and Peter Eisenman's take on on Deleuze. You know, and that gave me a certain kind of mean pleasure. But actually, that would be to go against the grain of Deleuze's ethos. So there is an argument for sort of saying, well, that's fine. They picked up on the fold. Uh, they've taken it on from the point of view their disciplinary point of view and problematics that is architecture and they've done something with it Um, and that's perfectly fine but then they have to be very careful about what they claim to have achieved from it and whether in using that concept they've really managed to deal with the sorts of problems that are that have been worth asking, you know. Um, I love this, uh, Isabel Stengers, who's written, you know, she's a philosopher of science and uh, uh, she's she's written some phenomenal work uh, engaging in Guattari to talking of um, an ecology of practices. Uh, she's been a big influence on me when I was writing the creative practice, uh, creative ecologies book. Um, she, she, she sort of actually says somewhere, well, you do, you you um you have the philosopher you um you have the problems you claim the problems that you deserve. So if you claim a particular problem that's not working out very well for you, or you make a bit of a mess of it, well, it's your own fault for having not been very careful. So I, I love this sort of warning to to um you know anyone anyone entertaining a problem in architecture in philosophy elsewhere that you've got to be really wary of the parameters you're taking and um. Um, so yeah, there's that, there, you know, I got much more relaxed about it later, you know, it, it was like, yeah, whatever, they did this interesting thing with the fold. Well, okay, good for them. But I think my point and the point I was also making in this lecture is that at the same time, there are many other equally interesting, even more interesting, I would say, scholars in architecture doing stuff with Deleuze and Guattari's concepts, such as Jennifer Bloomer who's, you know, composed the most remarkable work in, um, you know, architecture in the text uh, that preempts some of what we're seeing today around domains such as, I I would argue, new materialism, which has been an interesting legacy of Deleuze and Guattari's work, this kind of rethinking of uh, a sort of non-hylomorphic notion of uh, material relations. Um, And so, you know, these dominant voices that take over the airspace and claim the expertise uh, you know, that's what I have an issue with, you know, they're taking up too much space. What about other thinkers, you know, grappling? Uh, and they're, they're also over-determining what we can do with the fold, you know? Um, so that that would be my continued gripe, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, Jennifer Bloomer, she's disappeared off the scene completely now. I haven't seen what's happened, but it, but it was remarkable, that particular book. I mean, I guess my other gripe that I have about, about, um, the way that philosophy is often used um, is is that it's it's often used in the final paragraph of anaesthetics was about this. It's, it's used as an intellectual veneer, you know, to to lend credibility to your position. You know, you quote someone deep, meaningful, and that kind of therefore your project must be good. Um, and and to that extent, I you know, I, to, I always wonder whether the kind of the project that was going on in the nineties, late eighties and nineties, which seemed to be supposedly resisting postmodernism wasn't really part was it actually really part of it in some way you know the mm-hmm. kind of you know, kind of it, it's and i that's my suspicion i mean um uh anyway but i don't want to go down that line line but it, it is kind of worrying to think well actually it, it, i mean books like rethinking architecture were really popular but why were they popular and it and i think it's the the kind of intellectual posturing that they they allowed you to uh, come up with um but anyway um, no, for sure. There's there's totally the risk of that. I think I think the I mean some of the further preliminary m- remarks I should have said in even before I began and some of uh, my reflections as I was composing this lecture. You know, uh, when you first invited me, I was going, oh gosh, uh, am I going to have to read everything again? Oh no, I don't have time for that. You know, and um, and uh, although I've published these works on Deleuze, I would never claim to be a Deleuzean or be a Deleuze expert. Like, if you want to claim that, then you need to have read, you know, all, all your Nietzsche, Bergson, Spinoza, um, Kant, even though Kant's an enemy thinker, uh, not to mention reading Proust, not to mention Kafka, not to mention, you know, like, and then all the names that proliferate. I mean, I don't think anyone can really claim to be a, a, a Deleuze specialist, but there is a really lively and lovely um, 
you know, collective of people working with or alongside Deleuze intersecting and exiting again. So it's, it is about this encounter and relationship rather, I think. Mm. Just one thing, I mean, the, 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 you, you mentioned in your talk about the dynamic that was going on between Deleuze and Qatari, and actually you probed a little bit further than, than Andrew did, who was kind of saying, well, it's a bit mysterious. And, uh, but I, I, and I often wonder about that, you know, what was that dynamic at work? And clearly, you know, it, 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 uh, it was very, very productive, shall we say. And I think that, you know, I, I wonder, aha, uh -huh, okay, is it? Yeah, so this this would be the this would be the book to have a little look at. Um, Deleuze and Guattari intersecting lives, where Francois does um, talks about you know uh, the the extended group around Deleuze and Guattari before they met. You know, going hey, these two guys have got to meet. There's something going on, and and finally when they meet, and then this incredible energy and friendship that erupts, and and how their work, you know, they would write distinctly and intersect with each other. And um, there's, there's a suspicion that, uh, in fact, what is philosophy is primarily written by Deleuze and there's not that much Watari in it. And um, there was, a, there was a quite a negative response when that final collaborative work uh, came out uh, because many claimed that it was like a call to order. There are three disciplines, they're arranged in such a way, you must do this, you must do that. Um, but I, I see it rather as just that kind of, you know, well, as it says in opening, you know, having lived a long, long life, you know, trying to think back on what it was that we were doing together. And um, anyway, so what I love about what Francois does describes is that, you know, Guattari's totally frenetic. He's just like spinning out in a million directions at once. And whereas Deleuze is a slightly calmer force that sort of intersects with him. So they they do have different styles but it, it is also a bit like this notion of becoming when it intersects it does something together i mean when you when you read the three ecologies or molecular revolution or you know all these other wonderful works of guattari um they they're, they're totally all over the place you know um but they're you know they're their own thing and and he's a really an important thinker in his own right uh, so you you can read their different styles you know it's, it's not just a total yeah mm. yes i guess i mean uh, just thinking through that in the context of what andrew was saying about the farnsworth house about you know you can't see it in isolation it depends upon all this kind of background servicing in some ways you know even deleuze was kind of continually he was enmeshed in in a certain set of cultural values so i just the question i want to ask is is I mean, i'm a i'm a big fan of of, of mammals of anders but you know i just wonder when you when you remove uh guitari from the equation i mean uh what do you what are you missing in in that um no that's it yeah exactly um yeah and what would have happened if it was what would have happened if it was just um yeah, if, if there'd never been that, you know, profound encounter. I mean, I think it also says a lot to us about it's a real challenge to authorship. You know, they're constantly challenging the singular, um, I, you know, sovereign voice, um, especially in their collaborative works. Um, you know, Manuel Delanda's work is, is, is brilliant in its own right, but I've, I've often felt that his project, at least in his early commentary on Deleuze, has been to, to um, offer an explanatory out. Let us now explain this. Uh, this is, it goes back to mathematics. It goes back to that particular. But then, then it's like, all right, well, Deleuze and Guattari have developed this concept They've, it's a fantastic composite. It's a little like, you know, Burroughs cut up. It's this fantastic construction. And you're wanting to like um, analyze it and take it apart again. I mean, isn't the idea that we take the concept that they've constructed and like move it right along just and do something dramatic with it? So the explanatory sort of the will to explanation in Manuel de Landa, I've always found slightly, you know, it's like it's taking something out of the concepts, reducing it rather than expanding it, you know. Um, yeah, um, yeah. So, and I think it is very dangerous to take out Guattari. I mean, the 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 first sort of anglophone um, champion of Guattari would have to be Gary Gnosko, who's who's written on Guattari quite a bit. And um, and you know, I think the Deleuze Studies series of conferences. I ran I ran the Deleuze Studies conference, international conference in twenty fifteen in Stockholm. Um, I think now they're being referred to as De Deleuze and Guattari conferences because there's a recognition that the community is so diverse 
and that, you know, you can't really take, yes, you can take Deleuze out in isolation, but there's so much that intersects as well. And um, so, yeah, it, it's sort of weird if you don't make some reference to Guattari, I think. Yeah. Maybe we can open up to questions. I mean, we, we should be have a multiplicity here today rather than... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to join uh, without forcing anyone to to just while we're waiting for a question. There's uh, 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 this question in the chat. What was the name of the book again? Maybe you could. Just, oh, which book was that? The one the, the um on the the Deleuze and Guattari working together. The, oh yeah, um, Dele uh, it's it's by. Oh, let's see whether I have to. Can you see it this way? Intersecting lives. Oh no, I hate it when it does that. Intersecting lives by Francois Deleuze. 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 Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, it's big <laughs> and it's quite beautiful. It tells these exquisite stories of, you know, when you, when you study philosophy in France, uh, you don't kind of just end up in a university teaching university um, students. You have to go and do your year or two teaching in a high school, you know, maybe somewhere out in the provinces or whatever. And so there's these great stories of Deleuze arriving in the classroom uh, and doing things like arriving with his little briefcase and opening it and going, oh, mon Dieu, oh, I've, I've picked up someone else's case on the train. What's inside it? Oh, let's talk about what we've discovered inside this case. <laughs> you know, or he'd play the game of cadaverous ski with his students. You know, the fold up game where you create a monster, that surrealist game, um, exquisite corpse. And so, you know, you see what a powerful pedagogy was and um, uh, there's something quite exquisite about that. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, do we have some questions? I, I I have a few more questions, but I want to ask those questions. Um, I don't want I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but uh, um, yes, Marina, yeah. Um, uh, can you? How can we unmute you, Marina Rodriguez Des Neves? Hello, hi, uh, good night. Hi, uh, Marina. Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you, Helen. It was a it was a pleasure to to hear your, your lecture and it's an honor for me to have the opportunity to have a, an exchange with you. Um, and uh, one of my, my questions, uh, you mentioned about, uh, I mean, you, you, you mentioned diagrams as part of your, of your presentation. And uh, my, my question is in, in a way related with that, like what is uh, in your opinion, um, the role that uh, cartography uh, play mm. in the in the last uh, watery uh, now that we are talking about the less watery <laughs> uh, oh no totally yeah. well may maybe actually the best thing to do is to bring up a quote oh I, sorry just saying goodbye to my son's girlfriend um, <laughs> um I'll bring up a quote that I uh, that I didn't that I didn't oh wait a minute here we go touch on um, so you, you find cartography in a few places, uh, and I'm not going to be able to be exhaustive here. Uh, you certainly find it in one of the principles of the rhizome at work in the introduction to a thousand plateaus with the, the, the mapping, for instance, and the argument against tracing or decalcomania. Um, but you also find it like in a, such an exquisite quote as this uh, in, in Deleuze's Spinoza Practical Philosophy. Uh, where, where um, uh, yet another um, formula uh, that we could uh, introduce would be um, Deleuze's reading of Spinoza, where Spinoza argues that we do not yet know what a body can do. And the, the beautiful thing about this is that it's not that we're ignorant of what the body can do. It's rather that the body is going to continue to surprise us. It's not a closed project. We haven't come to the end of it. Furthermore, a body can be any, any kind of thing. It's not just a human body. It can be a body of water. It can be uh, an animal's body. It can be a collective social body. So the, th this body is something, it's the multitude, as, as Hart and Negri argue. You know, um, uh, um, Neg Negri, Antonio Negri was a big reader of Spinoza himself. Um, and so... Uh, Many Deleuze scholars will argue different things, but Spinoza is a really key thinker for um, Deleuze that, you know, expressionism, where is it? Some That was the one book that I had to cut and paste into my shelf because anyway, 
Um, that was like, you know, part of his PhD thesis, his big book, Expressionism in Philosophy, Spinoza. But here we find this, um, oh yeah, a body can be anything. Um, th this distinction in a cartographic way of longitude and latitude and um, in relation to the body in this beautiful quote, we call longitude a body of a body, the set of relations of speed and slowness of motion and rest between particles that compose it from this point of view, that is between unformed elements finding formation, you know. We call latitude the set of affects that occupy a body at each moment. That is the intensive states of an anonymous force, force for existing capacity for being affected. Uh, in this way, we construct the map of a body. Um, and, and so, you know, this would be a be one beautiful place in which to see their particular cartography, which inevitably informs a, a geo philosophy, um, a philosophy of the earth and an anticipation of a coming people and a, and a new earth uh, that we must work together on collaboratively, especially at the moment, um, amidst a concatenating climatic crises. Yeah. So that, that that question i think is is you know that the, they were almost i mean the way that certainly that, that andrew was presenting it they were almost uh proto kind of ecological kind of thinkers i mean it was it's are we misreading that or or uh I oh mean no that's absolutely the case i mean um and there's been a lot of work done on their kind of yeah geo philosophy and it is explicit when you read guattari's three ecologies uh, which sets out these three registers of you know mental social and environmental and how importantly those three registers have got to be sort of um uh, transversely hooked into each other. Uh, there's a strong ecological messaging at work here. Um, think of think of all of Deleuze's discussion of the semiotic biologist Jakob von Uxkull um, in this notion of you know um, the Umwelt, which for me in my book Creative Ecologies, I I sort of do a I do a literal translation from the German and called the Umwelt the environment world. Um coming from that which surrounds and Welt being world. And so I kind of, you know, take on that concept and, uh, and um, yeah, you know, reframe it. Um, and you find it also in the fold with this notion of the point of view in relation to uh, the context in which point of view is being framed. So the environment of one, in one way or another is there again and again. Um, uh, Professor Challenger's, you know, the, the little story in A Thousand Plateaus of Professor, Professor Challenger who sticks a massive sort of spoke into the earth and in order to hear whether the earth is going to scream or not, you know, there's, it's profoundly there, absolutely. Yeah. Do you, uh, um, um, Marina wants to follow up the question, but she's, she's muted. Can you un unmute her? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, today I was muted, so I couldn't like... I need the permission, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. So following the, that uh, thought on the, about maps, for example, and the role of uh, that theory have today in the, for architectural practice, I found like the title of your book that you uh, like, um, like in a way what when you are talking about to theor theorize the the practice, and I, I wanted to go to that point. And following this thought about maps, but in a way like uh, what it means finally to theorize a practice. Uh, and I mean, based in this famous conversation that uh, Deleuze and Foucault have when they say that it's not theory, a practice itself. Uh, Absolutely. I make reference to intellectuals and power in creative ecologies to explain this sort of interchange of theory practice, um, you know, that important relay that they describe and also this notion, uh, the, the, the toolbox notion of a concept construction uh, that, that Deleuze introduces when, when talking uh, with Foucault. So absolutely, it's um, uh, as they argue, and I argue in the book too, um, uh, it's not theory first and practice after or practice first and theory after. It's this, it's this uh, you know, to affect, to be affected. It's this reciprocal relay. It's this process of conceptual and sensory becoming. Um, necessarily. Neither one should be done in isolation. Theory without a problem to deal with or a practical issue 
is like so much hot air. Uh, practice that can't think for itself is at risk of achieving something extremely dangerous and stupid that destroys worlds rather than creates them. Yeah. Can, can I, Helen, one, one thing I, I, um, I'd love to hear more about since you've written so extensively on it, that is the, the, the diagrams that you were showing. Because, I mean, I, we, we came across the, the notion that the panopticon is, is actually a diagram of society, you know, and, and, and even as architects with our particular view about what a diagram is, uh, that kind of makes sense. And you can look at the panopticon and say, yeah, that's how society works. But these other diagrams, the Baroque house and this other one you were focusing on, I really don't know how to take them. I mean, they're, they're visual, but what do they actually mean? How do you, how do you take the diagram and, and use it in that? No, absolutely. In fact, you know, if I ever get enough hours in the day, which I won't, um, I've got this project that I've been wanting to work on forever, and that is to capture as many of Deleuze's actual diagrams as possible and to animate them because, um, oh, just a minute. Ugh. If I just share the screen again to show you, like I, I come back again and again to this sort of uh, rethinking of this diagram Um is that going to work? Oh, no. Um, so, you know, Deleuze and Guattari are constantly extending invitations. Don't repeat them. That totally goes against uh, the ethos that they're, you know, wanting to share. Um, intersect with them and do something else. And so, you know, when I look at this uh, diagram from uh, Deleuze's reading of Foucault, uh, it occurs to me that it's, this is, you can think it like an architect in a way, okay? An architect understands what it means to take a, a small part of a section um, and then understand that the section actually, oh, this is just one small part. That means, oh, it's joined up with other folds, of course. It's not just one zone of, of subjectivation. It's multiple zones. And then if we're multiplying that, them, then we get something of a plane, you know, it might my, my totally dopey drawing. And maybe we, you could even, I've even done a drawing where you kind of create a whole global sort of, you know, you turn it into a globe even. Anyway, you can kind of play with it. And years ago, I even did a, with students, we animated it, you know, turning into this peristaltic field that's, you know, uh, we have to imagine that this is just a, a snapshot, like the photo from the movie, you know, it's actually, it's moving and, and this fold, it disappears and it, 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 it's formed and then it disappears. You can imagine it popping or something. And it's like a big fart, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, so uh, this is, I think, the invitation that, that Deleuze totally, totally gives. Like you take up the diagram and you try and intersect with it. This is the, the you want to, the whatever principle from the rhizome in, 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 in the call to kind of undertake your own, produce your own map. Um, uh, so I, I think they're definitely aids to thought and he uses them in his seminars. Uh, we find many of them in A Thousand Plateaus, many to do with uh, often constructions of uh, subjectivity. Um, uh, there's the Baroque house, of course, that you've introduced as well um, with its little details. Uh, yeah, so um, there's, qu there's quite a group of them. I think more, it'd be fun to do more work on that. That'd be great. No, absolutely. I, I, I'm clueless because that Brock house does look like an architectural drawing and it is so tempting to do it. But I mean, so there must be some other discourse going on that is appropriating the language of architectural drawings in a way that I, I'm still, I mean, I think I mean, if you could write that book, I can see how incredibly uh, industrious you've been in publishing so many others, but that's what that one would be very useful to try and work that one out. I mean, it is extraordinary what to, what. Yeah. what uh, I can share an essay where, where I've I've articulated three senses of the diagram. Don't don't get me to rehearse them now. I'm going to get them wrong. I'd have to reread my own essay. <laughs> but, um, well, but, but, I, I can send you something. Is 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 whether I mean I'm a little bit suspicious. I I never would, took was never part of the whole diagrammatic discussion going on architecture. To be honest, I somehow it passed me by. But I was a little suspicious that the the way in which the, the even the term diagram has been used in that in that area. What would you comment on that i oh, know that well that that's right because there was one of the um 
one of the uh, one of the any magazines was dedicated to the diagram and 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 you know there was there was you know um Peter Asman's diagram diaries that were coming out at the time and so there was a bit of a sort of thing with diagrams and so forth um and then it seemed to pass by in a way I mean I think the thing with the diagram is it's 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 also just a very banal it's a very banal uh, instrument that we use to try and explain something schematically. So we can take it from its, in its very banal, most banal sense. We, we depend on them um, fundamentally in architecture as a think tool, I suppose. Um, and Deleuze is using them much in that way. Uh, he's thinking through the concepts and arguments and relations that he's attempting to introduce. And, um, you know, you see these, these little movies of him drawing them up on the blackboard, you know, and um, uh, yeah, I think I think they're just both ordinary. But then, I for me, the important thing is they're not about representing something so much as mapping uh, dynamic relations um, between subjects, objects, things, environments. Mm. I mean, I, it is interesting because you don't often find philosophers, I know Zizek or anything, actually using any visual material, even Delanda doesn't use that. And certainly Mark Cousins, mm. to find a philosopher who's using visual material is, is, is absolutely intriguing. And I, I, you know, I, I think there's something, there's something interesting there to be, uh, to be uh, interrogated. I mean, one of the things I was been looking at in, in my writing was, it's a really banal sounding uh, concept architecturalization which is to say how architects you know filter i mean uh, t things and they you see this certain you, you see certain terms and you think they're talking about buildings i mean they obviously filter anything you look at this sydney opera house coming out of the 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 the, the, the sales of yachts in the harbor you, know, you can be inspired by forms and turn them into architecture but the way that architects get trans uh, the concepts get translated into architectural forms is actually kind of interesting in itself and you can again you can criticize it and say well that's complete misunderstanding but there's something incredibly creative about it and i and i, I don't know what that what how, what how i can value how you can judge that creativity but there's something intriguing about the architectural imagination translating things constantly into forms you know it's it's a Oh, no, I, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. No, for sure. And not to be un underestimated. Mm. Mm. I've got a bit of a dog barking situation in the background. Hopefully right. he's going to calm down soon. Um. Do we have any other questions from, from the audience today? Um. There's about the influence of Deleuze and Guattari in the arts, architecture and the sciences. And technology in collaboration with theory and its transgressive works. Um, hey, um, Gustavo, hmm. you, any particular, you are putting a lot of notes in there. Do you want any particular questions you want to ask? Gustavo has lots of um, comments yeah. and questions. I think, I think that there is, a, there is a, there is a special issue of the Deleuze series, the series that's just dedicated to Deleuze and technology. And I don't know whether he's published it, but Daniel Smith, who's a wonderful reader of Deleuze, his, his book on essays, he gives a mean lecture and his, his book on of essays on Deleuze is really one of the go-to ones, I think, in terms of some of my favourite, like, Deleuze thinkers. Um, he, he discusses technology. And, of course, Deleuze famously, um, it, you know, is partly responsible for introducing Gilbert Simondon to an Anglophone audience too, in that we receive Deleuze and we receive the people that he's discussing. Um, Gilles Debert being a very, an extraordinary thinker of technology, uh, but there are, there are many thinkers of technology that we find um, in Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari's work. Um, so, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that's been published on that for sure that you can dig into. Mm. Um. Sorry, G, can you unmute uh, Gustavo? Okay. Um. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Helen, and uh, thank you, Neil. But I'm quite inspirational. I, I can't tell you <laughs> how much uh, how much was covered. Um, I guess my question, I think you brought up the idea of data and kind of how maybe we can see um, this body of work in kind of a, a different metaphorical understanding of where we are 
in kind of our evolution of society. When I remember uh, covering D&G in art school, there was a different understanding of how you can embody different selves and different understanding of language and how it slips from form to concept. Um, but in architecture now with technology and science, it seems so we, we are confronted with the computational language and the, the, the modeling of these different types of uh, metaphors of existence. So I, my, my, my question is, how would Deleuze and DNG see the idea of artificial intelligence and quantum computing? Mm. Uh, it seems as though that in those two <laughs> paradigms, if they're linked, uh, there is going to be some sort of um, uh, re-territorialization and deterritorialization. it seems are going to be unified somehow in a different type of understanding. Um, but can you please comment about that? No, re really good questions. Um, you know, uh, the, the first thing that should absolutely be said is that there's no way in which Deleuze and Guattari can be described as sort of um, anti-technological. They've got a very profound philosophy of technology that they articulate using some very interesting thinkers. In terms of, um, you know, in, engaging our sort of new data scapes, uh, which, you know, since Deleuze killed himself in 95 to now, what radical transformations of our worlds have taken place. What would he think of that? What would he think of AI? Um, well, I just can't help but going back to his warning in postscripts on societies of control. Uh, like, like, like any tool, the tool can become a weapon, as someone sort of noted in, in, in the comments. And um, we need to keep our wits about ourselves uh, in order uh, not to allow our technology to become, as Donna Haraway might say, we're becoming increasingly dull and our technology ever more bright. Um, so I, uh, there's not a simple answer. And in fact, I think the thing would be is to ask the question yourself and try and work it out. Uh, but there'd be plenty of resources there, both in the work of Deleuze and Guattari. And Deleuze, uh, Guattari also writes a lot about sort of media himself. Um, so, you know, there's a, you can, you can, there's a point of intersection between some of uh, Guattari's essays and uh, thinking new media. Um, uh, you could definitely do it. I can't give you. I can't give you a very neat answer now because I'd have to go away and sort of work on that myself to give you a good enough answer. Only to say that I've often commented on um, the peculiar way in which the fold, in particular, did get received into architecture, and many people have commented on that. The first edition of folding in architecture being in 1993 and the second edition in 2004, uh, that's a period in which um, the role of the computer in the design office and in the act of design sort of uh, that engagement has sort of, we've totally uh, taken up computation and computational processes in that time. And, and, and that bridges that moment of reception of Deleuze. And at which point then we kind of just give Deleuze away in the field of architecture or so it seems because it's never as simple as that really. Um, so that, that, that sort of mapping of Deleuze's influence that comes at a time where there's the uptake of, um, you know, uh, the digital in architecture is something interesting to remark upon, I, I think. Um, and you talk to some people who are engaged in computation and architecture or digital architecture, and they'll often say, oh, it's important to read early Bernard Cash, even though, you know, that's not, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, Cash have, having himself lent a concept to Deleuze in, in Deleuze's seminars that's evident in the fold, the concept of the projectile. Um, anyway, there's, there's any number of ways that, you could do that work yourself would 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 be the main thing I'd want to say. Yeah. Let me just quickly uh, just chip in something there because I did I did invite Bernard Cash to this session. Um, and I mean, first of all, I I uh, I, I heard him talk in in, in um, uh, the course in Barcelona where Anna um, was studying the bio digital course there and uh, at a conference many years ago. And I asked him this question. I said, well, what was what? How do you think Deleuze would have responded to this? Uh, the digital world in which we operate and, and he said well 
Deleuze wasn't very technological. He didn't have a television, but I don't have a television either, so it doesn't make me. <laughs> but, but he actually was. I mean, I think I, I think with Bernard, it's kind of interesting. I asked him, and he said, he's, and he said, I'm I'm mutating Deleuze into Desarg, D E S A R G U E S, which I think is a mathematician. And, and, uh... and uh, anyway, so but I think he's kind of rejected in some ways the Deleuze thing. But, and, and moved on. But I, I had a question because actually, in a way, I was trying to, because, I mean, we, there is a, a dominant strand of, you know, uh, uh, of uh, surveillance capitalism, a kind of critique of, of this, of, of the logic of surveillance that's going on, which I always find a little bit of a technological determinist view in a sense, because it can be both positive and negative, right? And, and, I, um, and, and, and I actually, when you think about Qatari, he kind of, you know, well, in that postscript to side of control, control, Deleuze says, uh, Guattari has imagined the possibility of having this kind of card that we should get you open doors and things. Of course, that happens already, right? We, we have cards, entry cards, and things like that. Now it's all facial recognition. So it's even more dematerialized in some senses. Mm. <laughs> The question is, is whether um, whether it's whether they're entirely negative about these things. I mean, there has been a shift. I mean, a, a while back in the UK, there was a famous Jimmy Bulger case where people realized that actually CCTV cameras are quite useful in protecting you. So don't get worried about them. And then <laughs> because of COVID, there's this argument from Zizek and Ben Bratt and others saying, well, well, maybe we need to keep data on people. Maybe we need to track people for, for the reasons of health. And I'm not quite sure whether whether we're pigeonholing them because I, they seem to be a bit more open than that. Um, no, for sure, I agree. And I think they're very, uh, neither of them are mu much into kind of saying something is good or something is bad. You know, it really is a matter about, again, t totally kind of situating uh, whatever is the problem at hand. So they're interested, you know. Um, so you couldn't come at it with, with and they've got a very, again, a very sophisticated argument about technology. I'm just thinking of the discussion of the stirrup and how the stirrup connects to the horse and how the horse and the stirrup together connect to the formation of an empire. You know, like how technology does that and they're interested in modes of connection in that way um yeah famously also in charles de Valle, uh interviews deleuze uh, on his cinema books and says um so what have you been looking at the movies again on you know vhs tape and deleuze goes what i don't have a magnetoscope or you know the french word for uh, no you know and it's like well is he just doing it from memory or probably he's also able to just wander around Paris and go to one of the many 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 cinemas that there used to be around I don't know whether yeah whether there are as many cinemas as now as there were when Deleuze was probably not was writing um yeah and Bernard Cash has also described to me how you know I, I remember distinctly Bernard Cash at one point going yeah, even Deleuze's chairs were sort of tied together with string. So there was a sense of furniture barely holding together and everything and um, the classic kind of crazy philosopher thing. Um, yeah, so no, you, you, I think that they're helpful. They're helpful thinkers to Deleuze issues warnings, I think, and cautions. And they do that about all of their, um, you can never be an extremist with them, you know, the line of flight, which seems to be a valorized concept. They give a very clear warning in A Thousand Plateaus that the line of flight can also lead to death um, when it becomes extreme. Um, so, yeah. Well, I, I just, I mean, one thing I do think is, is that in some ways, I mean, I, 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 I find them ahead of their time for many reasons, actually, you know, that comment that Deleuze is the kind of the, the, the think of the 20, 20th century, I think he's 21st century in many ways, but one of the things that's, that's happened now that we were never able to predict is precisely what's happening here, right? This idea of a platform where there is no hierarchy, where we're all interconnected, you know, and um, and it's it, it actually in many ways it, it's it's supporting that project in some senses, and even frankly in digital futures we don't have a hierarchy at all. It's a kind of body without organs. We kind of we, when something happens we all kind of rush in there and try and do something, and you know it's a very adaptive sort of mechanism. And I've seen now you know books coming out about. Um, What's the what's the what's the what, something like it was no rules rules you know the idea of business these days is is actually not to have these structures these rigid structures of the, of the past but other ways of operating so I I maybe I'm misreading or overreading Deleuze but I see him as a thoroughly contemporary thinker from that point of view and in many ways ahead of his time. 
No, for sure. I, I would argue that there are hierarchies at work here, though, Neil, I think. Like you've you've curated the series, you get like experts to come and talk about the thinkers and and the students, you know, they're not being very vocal at the moment. <laughs> hey, you students, speak up for yourselves. <laughs> Well, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that, that that maybe that's, I mean, one of the things we, we, we try to do with Digital Futures is, is to try and reverse the flow. It's always been, you know, people coming to the centres to kind of like London or New York or Melbourne or something to study. But now it's we can actually hear, you know, and, and hear from people in other in other spaces, which I think has been really uh, amazing. We had some sessions on um, on Bangladesh, for example, incredible. Mm. Interesting, uh, you know, and and sea level rise from different places, or the Brazilian um, forests, and so on. it was really, really super interesting. But so potentially it has that, you know. I, I, I you know, I, I agree that there are, you know, once you, I mean, there's this beautiful comment which I must say that you know I, I really love is this, um, it, the the Zimmel's. I don't know if you know the Zimmel essay Bridge and Door that appears in Rethinking Architecture, but it's such a beautiful description of. of um, the, the dialectic and he's talking about uh, he had the bridge and the door are not bridges and doors they're actually they're they're, they're, they're concepts so and it's about mm. how the human mind works and the the mm. human mind um uh it either we either connect things or we separate them we distinguish them that's what we do but he makes this beautiful comment that you can't connect unless it's already separated and you can't separate unless it's connected so what you do tend to find, I think, when you connect everyone in this way on this global platform is precisely the differences between different spaces. It highlights in some senses the, the differences in, in, in different places. Um, and, I, and for sure, we, we are, you know, whatever, we are not an equal world for, for different reasons. I mean, not least the vaccination question right now and, mm. and so on. No, I, but um, yeah. Uh, Matt, sorry, you've got a question there. Um, Matt, Matt Gorbay, do you wanna, um, can we unmute oh. you? Hi, Matt. Oh. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, it's not a question so much as I was just grappling with this material. It is, it is, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And I and I feel like I'm not a, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm still kind of putting it all together. But one of the things that really struck me is, you know, we, we talked about, or we heard about, I should say, um, the uh, the ecology and the importance of the ecology, and then we also later heard about this warning and this you know, I, idea of you know the society of control and how these things that we aren't even really necessarily aware of that are seeping out of us they're being collected they're being and and to me it just struck me that it's a little bit like when when we do that and we say that aren't we considering ourselves to be more like the tree and all of the data as it becomes decorporealized and spread out across isn't that more like the rhizome and don't isn't aren't all these interconnections the thing we were celebrating just moments ago um and so in a sense and 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 so what i'm really appreciating is the nuance that you were bringing to it by saying it's it's not about good or bad and it's it's it, and everything has to be taken within the context and then held up against the context in order to evaluate it so i think i'm i'm learning a lot tonight i'm, I'm appreciating this but i but i i did i did kind of wonder because all of that uh, the, there was a passage you read about good ideas and bad ideas and comparing good ideas to weeds. Oh, sorry, bad idea. It was, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if it was in your talk or the previous one. It was, it but, was Andrew Ballantyne. Sorry. Um, yeah, so from yeah, Bateson, it it's a great so, quote, yeah. <laughs> it is a good quote, but I wonder about judgment then, right? Because mm -hmm. they're saying bad ideas. There are clearly, these are bad ideas, right? And there's bad ideas. And, and I love the sense when you have a garden that weeds are simply the ones you don't like, right? It's very subjective. If you you know if you if you don't like a flower it's a weed pull it out if you love this weed it's a flower keep it and I feel like from what you've been saying is a lot more that's more consistent with the sort of philosophy that we're being presented with here but but then uh, but then that was a very specific quote like bad ideas there are clearly bad ideas so I wonder about this big question. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. No, that's it. No, that that's that that's so that's Gregory Bateson saying there's an ecology of bad ideas much as there is an ecology of weeds. Um, okay. Because we've got to, I guess we've got to recognize that um, for me, I, I think this is so powerful because especially if you're you're doing more theory than practice, let's say, you know, um, uh, you're always at risk of just being kind of placed in a theory corner as though this makes no material difference. But when you begin to understand that concepts pack a material punch, that concepts are dangerous, that they're both tools, or I like to call them concept tools, um, and weapons, um, depending on how they're uh, reused, then um, then you then you understand that um, 
uh, maybe maybe you can make some of that assessment at a certain point. All right. Well, this didn't turn out so well, did it? I think right. I think good and bad, strictly speaking, Deleuze would probably be okay with. And he just he does discuss this. Oh gosh, I can't think whether it's in um, the work on Spinoza or whether uh it might be in the logic of sense maybe even um it's it's good and evil that he will have no um you know uh, no, no truck with so right, right. moral frameworks that are universalizing these these are problematic because they don't go with the flow you could say ethical practice you know allows for you to get things wrong from time to time uh, there's no right answer you just need to give it a go um that 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 would be more the orientation in a way so good and bad oh it didn't work out so well in, in a localized sense as distinct from always evil and always good so that there's a powerful argument that Deleuze makes when you read Spinoza about a distinction between moral frameworks and ethical practice um that's really important for him um, yeah, and then that what you were saying about each subject being something like the tree and we're connected up through data, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, certainly I wouldn't have meant it to be like that at all because uh, from the very beginning of Deleuze's uh, career with his first book on David Hume, he's explicitly interested in how subjectivity is constructed. So when he reads the uh, um, British empiricist David Hume, who famously argues that this, the self is a fiction composed as a bundle of impressions, you know, I, I love Hume. I really got into him when I was at philosophy school. Um, this is totally radical, you know, like, okay. But it's also terrifying because we like to kind of, in a phenomenological sense, feel secure in our self-sameness and when we're told this is not the case then you know what kind of footing are we meant to be on here um so remember again those funny little folds of subjectivation that kind of pop and disappear and dissipate and form again and um this is rather the connectedness but um like anything a part of that ecology can go sour and weedy if if it's not cared for in the best possible way and with that actually i'm really going to have to go because um I promised I would do something with my son, my both my sons. And, um, yeah, so I think I'm going to have to sign out, actually. The, the, Helen, thank you so much. I, I just wanted to just add something to Matt while he's there, and that's to say that I think that uh, Deleuze and Guattari should be fantastic for the work that, that he's doing with Philip Beasley, they're living systems. And I think All so right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Oh. Uh, fantastic. Really. So, Helen, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. It's really been brilliant. And, and just to be able to, to hear you, I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. And um, and, and we will upload this. And I don't know if it's been seen as, as viewed as many as others, but it's it, we've had uh, a thousand or so viewers for, or, on some of our things so much so, so far, and it'll carry on building up in the future. So, Helen, thank you so much for your generosity. Um, and thank you for your for your wisdom. It's it's a, it's a it's there's been lots to, to to chew upon today, and I think this has been a a very special session that that um, I hope will be a resource in the future for for scholars all over the world. So uh, thank you, Helen, and uh, and come and join us again some other time. It's been fantastic. Totally, awesome. yeah. Thank thanks for the invitation. Stay well, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.